Tamam. As you can see, the title of my talk is Tuning the Brain for Well-Being with Transcranial Ultrasound, TUS. <clears throat> Oops. That's the laser, sorry. <laughs> I zapped somebody, I'm sorry. So well-being is a synonym for a lot of words, including flow, as we heard in uh, two talks previously. Sorry about that. Uh, for optimized states of consciousness. So the real question, if we're going to really do this, is what is consciousness? Now, there are many ways to approach this problem from going clockwise. Neuroscientists, roboticists, artists, uh, physicists, psychiatrists, anesthesiologists, that guy kind of looks like me, um, meditators, and uh, philosophers. And uh, in Eastern philosophy, uh, if, you, if you go back to the previous one, Bing is meant to uh, imply conscious awareness. Bing is everywhere. We're, uh, we're conscious beings in a sea of consciousness. That's Eastern philosophy. Now, uh, <clears throat> I can't read this slide. Okay. Uh, conscious, uh, in Western philosophy, uh, or Western science in the West, uh, the, the brain, the mind has always been compared to uh, the, most, uh, the pre current information technology, going back from the Greek seal rings and, wa and wax for memory, uh, telegraph sw switching circuits, uh, the subconscious boiling up, uh, Carl Prevam's hologram, music. I personally think the consciousness is more like music than it is a computer, but mostly computer. And that has certainly dominated things uh, recently. So we have a bunch of neurons connected by variable synapses, which is kind of like nodes and switches in a computer. So everybody has assumed uh, for many years that the brain is a computer with consciousness kind of as the, um, as the output. But there are problems with this. Uh, we can't really explain consciousness for one thing, and it renders consciousness epiphenomenal and, uh, because it, the activity happens too late. So it means that we're really kind of long for the ride, a, a helpless spectator, as T.H. Uh, Huxley said. It precludes the possibility for any non-locality, spirituality, near-death, or out-of-body experiences. The possibility of an afterlife is out the window because it's a, a strictly classical uh, computer and uh, <clears throat> and brain mapping. We've heard a lot in the last uh, de uh, few years about spending billions and trillions of dollars and euros to map every neuron in the brain, every connection. Well, a few years ago, some people got smart and they said, "Wait, w there's this worm, the C. elegans. Uh, we know every neuron, we know every synapse, we know uh, everything about the nervous system. Let's just do that in a computer, and we'll see it swim around, and uh, we'll we'll go from there." Well, they did it, and guess what? Nothing happens. The worm just sits there, it lies there, and there's no activity. Something is missing. Something is missing other than the uh, connections uh, at the neuron. Now, on the other hand, there's a single cell organism, one cell, no synapses, the paramecium, for example, that swims around. It bounces off of obstacles, as you can see. It, uh, it avo avoids obstacles. It, it avoids predators. It finds food. It finds a mate. It has sex. Uh, in fact, there's an X-rated, the only X-rated slide you're going to see today probably of two paramecium uh, fused and having sex, and we don't know if they're conscious or not. <laughs> but um, uh, the only time uh, they're actually absolutely still is during, uh, during sex, so they may be uh, uh, working on their quantum coherence. Now, how do they do that? Uh, if you see the upper left is a paramecium, the little hair-like things uh, sticking out that are both sensors and ores or cilia. And you can see the structures, made of structures called microtubules. And there are nine doublets or triplets of these microtubules, and they stick out, and they both sense and, and move. And uh, I got obsessed with microtubules 40 years ago in medical school. And, and uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit more about them. Now, how the cilia bends is that these microtubules, and you can see one at the bottom, have these ATPase uh, uh, motor proteins that bend back and forth, kinine and dynine and, and kinesin. Now, why am I telling you about this? Well, it turns out that the exact same uh, structure, the microtubule and the dynein and kinesin, uh, are at work in the nervous system. So uh, in learning and synaptic plasticity, uh, stuff synthesized in the cell body needs to get to a synapse. Downstream has to go left, right at, at, at branching points. And it does so by tr being transported by these motor proteins. And the tau proteins, the red things, tell the uh, <coughs> motor proteins proteins where to get off and where to deliver their cargo. They're kind of like the traffic signals. And tau, you might, you might remember, is important in, in Alzheimer's disease. And in Alzheimer's disease, we have neurofibrillary tangles where the tau falls off and the microtubules destabilize. And in fact, 
Alzheimer's, now there's the amyloid plaques outside the neurons, but the pathology correlates with the, with the neurofibrillary tangles, with the tau falling off, and the microtubules disintegrating. If that happens, you get symptoms, you lose memory, you lose cognition, and that's Alzheimer's disease. <clears throat> now, let's, let's look at the brain a little bit, and here's the cortex, and there's uh, three, uh, three uh, steps, more or less, when signals reach cortex. They go to uh, layers at the top and bottom, and then they converge on two other layers, and they all wind up on layer five pyramidal cells. So if there's one place in the brain that consciousness occurs, I'm not saying it's the only place, it's in layer, these layer five pyramidal cells. And the apical dendrites that go to the sur surface give rise to EEG, because they're only perfectly vertical ones and everything else cancels out. So EEG comes from pyramidal cell apical dendrites. Now if we look in, uh, and so Bing must be in pyramidal dend dendrites. If we look inside one, we see all these microtubules in this interesting mixed polarity. Now, they're part of the cytoskeleton, you would think for structure, you wouldn't want to break them in little pieces, but, so this is lousy for su structural support, but really good for information processing. And uh, so I think bing is happening <coughs> in the microtubules and in the, in the uh, pyramidal cells. So <clears throat> let's look at microtubules. I, I, as I said, in medical school in, early, in 1972, I found out about microtubules and mitosis. They were in neurons. I was learning about computers. And I said, hey, they must be processing information, supporting uh, mitosis, information processing, memory, and even consciousness. And I worked on a, a bunch of models with physicists like Steen Rasmussen and, and others uh, at Los Alamos as microtubule automata, the idea that microtubules are the information processing devices inside cells. They can account for not only uh, cilia, but also consciousness in the brain. And so I published a bunch of papers uh, showing information processing possibilities, uh, and then uh, hooked up with Roger Penrose to develop a quantum model that I'll tell you about very, very briefly. So let's talk about memory a second. What we know about memory is from long-term potentiation, LTP, where if you stimulate the upper neuron uh, high frequency briefly, the lower one will stay, the, the synapse will stay uh, hypersensitive for a long time. And one of the steps is calcium comes in and activates an enzyme called calcium calmodulin kinase 2, CAMK2, which latches onto microtubules. It's a beautiful snowflake-shaped molecule. When the calcium comes in, it extends these kinase domains. It looks kind of like a nanopoodle or, or something really strange. But this is what's uh, delivering memory into our cells by phosphorylating something. Well, what might it be? Well, it turns out, as we show in this uh, paper, that it's quite likely that uh, CAMK2 is encoding memory in microtubules. You see how perfectly it overlays with the microtubule lattice, the A lattice and the B lattice, shown in gray at the top. And so what probably happens in memory is that CAMK2 comes down on a microtubule, lands on it, and deposits six bits, up to six bits of information on a microtubule. And hundreds and thousands of these happen with each synaptic event. So the information capacity storage for memory in microtubules is enormous. And, uh, <clears throat> so the and, and I was going around uh, telling AI and singularity types uh, that your 10 to the 16th operations per second, which they calculated based on neuronal bits, was, was, uh, uh, was, was way too short. And actually, they needed to consider the microtubules to get to 10 to the 27th operations per second. So they didn't like me very much, because it was pushing their goalpost uh, way, way far down. And I became unpopular in AI and, and singularity, and remain so, as far as I can tell. Uh, <laughs> But I, th I, I think they're, they're way wrong on this. But how does that explain consciousness, emotions, feelings, being? Uh, it doesn't. And fortunately, uh, somebody uh, uh, suggested I read a book by, by Sir Roger Penrose, which I did. And, and I don't have the time to go into this. But um, <clears throat> we developed a theory based on quantum computation and microtubules. And Roger developed a, a mechanism for consciousness. It's the only mechanism ever proposed for consciousness. It has to do with a particular type of collapse of the wave function due to uh, separate, he brought in general relativity, and I don't have time to go into it, but it connects quantum processes to the fine, fine scale structure of the universe, okay? Which means that consciousness uh, is, is, is uh, connected to the universe, uh, giving rise to non-locality, the possible, possibility of spirituality, and each collapse, each choice, each perception is influenced uh, by platonic values embedded in the universe. This was a mind-blowing book when I read it, The Emperor's New Mind. And I, th I think it's still, the, it's by far the, the, it's the only mechanism ever proposed, and more and more evidence seems to be supporting it. So on the lower right, you see how something happening in microtubules correlates uh, in, in some way with, with a quantum collapse in space-time geometry. That's a simplification of space-time geometry. 
Okay, so you can say, well, that's all well and good. Where's the evidence? Well, it turns out there is evidence. This is a gentleman, Anurban Banjapati, some of you know him, uh, took a single microtubule. He liked our theory, said, I'm going to test it. He took a, a single microtubule, uh, the red thing in the upper right, put four nano electrodes on him, because these things are really small, and it's a good insulator, but when you stimulate it with alternating current uh, at a certain resonant frequency, as you can see, about 10 and 20 megahertz, and also in the ki kilohertz in the insert, and also in gigahertz, not shown here, the conductance uh, goes way up, the resistance drops, and perhaps even superconductive if you could ignore the uh, interface between the nanoprobe and the microtubule. So this shows that microtubules have resonances, probably quantum resonances, in megahertz, uh, gigahertz, and, and kilohertz. And uh, <clears throat> he also showed in a subsequent paper that if you stimulate tubulin, which uh, assemble it in microtubules, at about two megahertz is a sweet spot, and the microtubules grow longest. So two megahertz, and this is electromagnetic, but microtubules are, are piezoelectric, will grow fast, will assemble uh, very quickly into long microtubules. Okay, uh, he then went to MIT and spent a year looking for this inside active neurons. These previously had been single microtubules uh, outside of neurons. Here he went and put these nanoprobes inside neurons and spent a year there, and they're just now they're writing up the paper. And uh, <clears throat> the bottom line is that if you look on the bottom, you see uh, what he calls triplets, sets of uh, resonances. And uh, at, at the left is the very slowest, which would be EEG, and then it goes to uh, kilohertz, uh, megahertz, gigahertz, and terahertz. And it's kind of like a fractal frequency, and it's very much like music. I, I think consciousness is more like music. And the, and the microtubules are the instruments. Uh, and uh, uh, <clears throat> Georgi Busaki, the GEEG expert at, at NYU, says that uh, the neuron is, is not a bit, it's a stratovarius. And I think the microtubules are the strings. And uh, they're quantum, quantum resonators. OK. Um, could you play that? So, so uh, I hope that you hear this sound. This is from Honorbaum's work. It's in the online backup material. This is singing microtubules, as he puts it, the, the audio coming out of the neuron. I'm going to shut up. You can see it's sweeping the frequency lower left. So that was uh, kilohertz. So that's apparently what it sounds like inside neurons. Now, this is actually uh, taken down into audio range, so that's not really what, what it sounds like. But, but it gives you the idea of the, of the frequency and the beats. And we actually think that the EEG uh, are beats of faster vibrations. If you have uh, like microtubules resonating at uh, uh, 10.001 megahertz and 10.00 megahertz, and they interfere, they're going to give you 50 hertz oscillations, which could be gamma synchrony. So we think that e Roger Penrose and I think that EEG is actually a beat frequency of faster vibrations and microtubules. So uh, consciousness is coming. Consciousness EEG is coming from uh, microtubules. Okay, so what? <laughs> If you consider that uh, brain microtubules uh, resonate in megahertz and are responsible for consciousness and mental states, could mental and cognitive uh, states and disorders be treated by applying megahertz vibrations to the brain? Which brings us into transformational technology. Now, uh, <clears throat> in electromagnetic waves, that's radio frequency. I I'm, don't really want to put radio frequency in, into the head. Uh, however, it's, in mechanical, it's ultrasound. Now, we know about the transcranial magnetic stimulation. We know about transcranial electrical uh, direct current and alternating current. But there's also ultrasound or s sound. And uh, y ultrasound is above 20,000 hertz. So it's above audible if you're a human. Dogs can hear it up a little bit higher. Goes up to several hundred megahertz. It's quite a, a broad range. 
And uh, when I found this out, um, I wondered if anybody had been putting ultrasound into the brain. We use ultrasound and anesthesia for imaging all the time. Uh, and I went, to, uh, I went to Google. Well, you know that ultrasound is used to image uh, the body, including uh, fetuses in utero. Uh, and uh, it can't be that bad for you, right? Uh, it doesn't seem to affect uh, things too bad. We've been, it's been around for uh, 80, or, 80 or 90 years. So was anybody putting it into the brain? And sure enough, this, uh, this guy, uh, Jamie Tyler, uh, had been doing it in animals, in rats. He had implanted uh, electrodes in rats and uh, gave them ultrasound, and he could control their behavior. And um, uh, he could, uh, for example, put it here, make their palm move. He could record electrophysiological effects. He got a grant to study the effects on uh, cognitive function in pilots and so forth. And you can see lower right his uh, first transcranial ultrasound headset, uh, fairly primitive. He started uh, NeuroTrack and Think, and think, the Think people are here. Uh, and, uh, and they have an electrical device, but they, they are also doing ultrasound. So um, I, since I wondered what it would feel like and whether we should, we should do it. And of course, uh, these ultrasound devices, uh, you can see pictures of them. We've seen other pictures. And if you put them on, you immediately look sexy and beautiful, apparently. Um, on the other hand, uh, there's me. And uh, I was telling my friends in anesthesia, you know, we should try this because uh, we have cr chronic pain patients who are depressed. And they said, we don't try it on anybody until we try it first. You got a shaved head. It was your idea. You go first. <laughs> and so uh, I did. And uh, I actually did it myself. I put it, put it to my right temple for about 15 seconds. I didn't feel a thing. I want to make sure the machine. I put it down. I said, well, the heck with it. It's not going to work. I didn't feel anything. But a minute later, I got a buzz. And I was energized. I felt really, really good for about an hour. I said, we should try this. So we, published, we did, and we did a study and published the first uh, human study on mental states uh, in, the, in late 2012, uh, actually uh, 2013, it came out uh, in print. Now, since then, uh, OK, I, we work with Think. We also work with the GE. And then there's a guy, Sterling Cooley, who's making this device. He got bought out and moved to China. And we're waiting for the device. And we're also using the Think. And we're using uh, any of the ultrasound devices uh, we, can, we can get. And uh, we've, uh, we just uh, submitted this, this study where, uh, for example, we showed the, the, uh, the waveform, uh, the, the good waveform is 2 megahertz for only 50, uh, 30 seconds. If you do it for 10 minutes, you don't get as good an, an effect. So you don't, uh, more is not better in this case. So 30 seconds is better than 10 minutes. And, uh, uh, we, and we also showed that 2 megahertz is better than 8 megahertz. Now, that's at the temple. If you put it at the vertex, you don't get it. You get a mixed bag on mood. But people reported funny things like uh, uncontrollable laughter, out-of-body experiences, uh, things like that. And uh, it's probably because, um, uh, oh, this slide didn't come up, did it? Um, and uh, here's, uh, here's 2 megahertz versus uh, placebo. And um, uh, we did, with modeling, we showed that the ultrasound actually penetrates through to the other side of the brain. So it gets through the brain quite well, even at fairly low intensity. So uh, you get gamma synchrony EEG uh, on the side that you apply it. And um, then this paper came out uh, early this year on rats from Australia. And they found that ultrasound, they were using ultrasound to open the blood-brain barrier. Um, it turns out uh, to get drugs across. But it turns out ultrasound alone improved the pathology in rats and also their memory function. And they said that you know, this should be tried in humans. It's going to take a few years to figure it out. And we said, yo, dudes, we've been doing this for three years. And so we are now starting studies on Alzheimer's. Since, uh, since we think we're resonating microtubules, Alzheimer's uh, microtubules fall apart. We're starting studies on, on Alzheimer's and uh, traumatic brain injury uh, based on an honor bond study that 2 megahertz uh, promotes microtubule assembly. And this study from my colleagues in India, Sadviki Gupta, that showed that ultrasound, so the red, the red ones are, are, get ultrasound. And this is microtubules assembling in a test tube, in a cuvette. And uh, temperature, um, uh, when, at room temperature, they start to disassemble. But with ultrasound, they stay together. And then uh, in, in concussion and head injury, the microtubules are fractured. And uh, our, other, our student, Uma Rahman, uh, uh, looked at cortical embryonic neurons. And ultrasound caused faster neurite sprouting. Uh, than controls. So we're starting studies of ultrasound on uh, Alzheimer's and traumatic brain injury, also pediatric uh, development, uh, ICU delirium, and so forth. So uh, I think it's a very, very promising uh, tool. Uh, I can't quite read my summary slide, but you can, uh, you can read it for me. Uh, I think uh, it's, it's painless. It's uh, safe. 
Uh, and I'm talking about low subthermal doses. Uh, at high doses, you can cause lesions, and some people use it to, to destroy seizure foci or tumors. We're talking about low intensity, completely painless, below the thermal threshold. And we've already shown it, it, it can be used for mood. We're doing studies on depression, memory, Alzheimer's, and brain injury. And I think it's, it's going to be really uh, good in the future. So thank you much for your, uh, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>